Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Anne Väljadaga and uh, I am a legal researcher here at the CCD COE. And today I am extremely honoured to uh, welcome you all to um, a book launch, a very special book launch, at least for me, because um, um, it seems like we are opening up a door to um, kind of undeservedly uh, underexplored territory. Um, due to my uh, digital rights advocacy background, I have been uh, um, I have been delegated to rewarding yet challenging task of lecturing. Uh, human rights uh, to uh, um, auditoria of predominantly uh, military background uh, during our uh, international law as applied to cyber operations course. And uh, after a year of having uh, more or less regularly fulfilled this duty, I discovered that why do I always stop when uh, international humanitarian law uh, kicks in when, uh, in the hypothetical scenarios, a real armed conflict uh, has broken out. And uh, the m magical spell of Lex Specialis has been whispered. Why do I always stop and why do I kind of intuitively presume that this is the time where uh, human rights law steps aside? Mm. Because uh, when talking about Lex like, Specialis, then at least when it comes to digital rights, there is not much specific in the presumed Lex like, Specialis. So I went searching high and low for answers. Uh, not many were relieved, revealed during this little query of mine, but except for one valuable source, uh, Asaf, Lubin, who uh, previously had contributed to uh, mm, Cycon Proceedings in 2018, had just written a draft exploring the rights to privacy and data protection in armed conflict. So, I contacted him and uh, we decided to add in the missing in ingredients in the form of uh, um, of uh, Russell Buggen's expertise in uh, uh, international law and cyber espionage and um, wide array of uh, in-depth knowledge of our wonderful co-authors or the authors of the chapters there. And I think that we understood that we in fact have a very good formula for exploring this uh, unmapped territory. So, um, whether or not uh, a reader chooses to agree with the arguments and conclusions uh, presented between the covers of the book, I think that we have succeeded when it inspires you to think. Why do we assume that human rights law applies or, mm, or alternatively does not apply or is it a uh, black and white case of absolutes, is there a grey area, and what are the components of this grey area. So, uh, on this note, I'm happy to uh, hand it over to our editors, the editors of the um, freshly published anthology, Azov Lubin and uh, Russell Bakken, so that they can introduce the very distinguished panel of discussions that we have. Thank you. So the way Russell and I, we're, we're going to keep our presentation brief because we're really interested in hearing uh, the comments of uh, our esteemed colleagues who, who have read the book and are offering feedback. The way we thought of introducing the book to you, which we hope you grabbed your own free copy, because there's nothing better than CCD CRE conferences than bringing home copies of books with you, uh, is that I'll introduce the general framework about why the topic is of importance, and then uh, Russell will take on the daunting, challenging of mapping out the way the book is structured and laid out. Um, and so, as was mentioned, I wrote a book chapter for another book on the concurrent application of human rights law in IHL back in 2018, 2019. Uh, and at the time when I was writing my own book chapter on the topic, there was nothing out there to build a theory around. And just to highlight to you why there is nothing out there, it's partially because of the laziness of our inst international institutions in trying to set out 
how the law applies in this space. Here, here's two examples. The ICJ Wall Advisory Opinion in 2004 acknowledged that Article 17 of the ICCPR on the right to privacy, quote, applied in the occupied Palestinian territory. But the court did not, however, go far further in clarifying why it applied or in what fashion it applied, or what specific consequences such application had on the issues before it. Similarly, a recently updated commentary to the Second Geneva Convention produced by the ICRC discussed the communication of personal health data by hospital ships uh, during armed conflict. The commentary noted that such data was, quote, must be afforded a reasonable level of security. As sources for this claim, the ICRC cites international privacy and data protection standards um, wherever those standards exist and apply. Much like the ICJ, the ICRC stopped short of actually clarifying when such standards apply, what theory grounds their application, and what is their exact meaning would be in a particular circumstance, say in the context of health data. And so when we created the idea behind this book, we hope that our contributing authors will step in and fill some of that void. And that is a real challenge in conceptualizing the new frontiers of human rights at the concurrent and their concurrent application in IHL in a digital rights environment. Just to situate us, let me give you one example. I'll use chapter seven from the book uh, by Leah West. Uh, she describes in that chapter the withdrawal of the US from Afghanistan. And she says, following the American withdrawal from Afghanistan in August 2021, Taliban forces moved through the country quickly, claiming control of not only villages, but also the arms and military equipment left behind by US forces. Also left behind were devices known as handheld interagency <coughs> detection equipment, or HIDE, used to collect, store, and upload biometric information collected from individuals in the field. In Afghanistan, information collected by HIDEs included personal facial pho photographs, iris scans, fingerprints, and biographical information. And then she concludes, a little is known about what, if any, safeguards were in place to ensure the data collected by coalition forces remaining on the devices or shared with the Afghan government could not be accessed or leveraged by the Taliban or other malicious actors to target civilians. Once again, US forces appeared to ignore the privacy interest of, of the Afghans for the sake of operational expediency. And as we move from the situation in Afghanistan, we might think about the use of CCTV cameras and AI by Israel in the context of the occupied Palestinian territories, or the use of particular um, mobile applications in the context of running the, their checkpoints in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Or you might think about, um, more recently in the context of Russia, Ukraine, uh, the release on social media of particular videos of Russian and Ukrainian detainees um, uh, in ways that might impact their privacy and in particular the obligation to treat them humanely. So again, the intersectionality between traditional IHL rules and the application of contemporary human rights comes into play. And that is at the heart of what the book strives to lay out. It adds to the complication that on top of the traditional right to privacy, there is yet another more emerging and complex right to data protection. And so part of our design of this panel today is that we have a speaker to look at one of each of these issues, IHL, human rights law, and data protection. And with that, I'll stop talking and move it on to us. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Azaf, uh, for that introduction. And yes, just to reiterate that the protection of the rights uh, to privacy in armed conflicts, and indeed uh, data protection in armed conflict more generally, is an important uh, and under-researched topic. And we believe that the book uh, would be of broad uh, interest and appeal to researchers, practitioners, uh, policymakers, and other stakeholders working across the disciplines of technology, human rights, international law, international relations and other disciplines. Just give me a, a few moments just to say a few words about the content of the book, to give an overview of its various sections uh, and chapters. The book is of course available for you uh, here and is available open access uh, online, um, um, but perhaps for the benefit of those who have not had a look yet, just, just let me uh, give a brief overview. The book is uh, split into four sections which cut across different themes. Section one explores the extent to which various regimes of international humanitarian law protect the rights to digital privacy and data protection. 
In the first chapter, chapter one, uh, Mary Ellen O'Connell advances the argument that the protection afforded by international law to personal data is the same during times of armed conflict as it is during times of peace. In chapter two, Tal Miran and Yuval Shaini zero in on the weapons review obligation contained in Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1, arguing that this provision requires state parties to integrate privacy concerns into their evaluation of new technologies such as cyber weapons, autonomous weapons, and the human enhancement of soldiers. In chapter three, Laurie Blanc and Eric Talbot Jensen examine the extent to which international humanitarian law governs the seizure, seizure requisition and destruction of data during times of armed conflict. Chapter four, Jacqueline Vandeveld assesses the extent to which the law of neutrality requires neutral states to monitor and prevent companies located within their jurisdictions from transferring data to parties to armed conflicts in breach of the rights to privacy and data protection. In chapter four, Omar Shahabi explores how the law of occupation, and in particular the obligations imposed upon occupying powers, can be progressively interpreted or reinterpreted to protect digital privacy. And in chapter six, Emily Crawford examines the privacy-related rights of prisoners of war in the digital age, and in particular identifies the types of data that detaining powers can collect from prisoners of war, which strikes me as a particularly important topic in light of the conflict in Ukraine. Moving to section two uh, of the collection, uh, it considers the impact of surveillance technologies on the enjoyment of digital privacy rights. As Ava has already said, in chapter seven, uh, Leo West explores the legal obligations arising during armed conflict that limit the use of facial recognition technology, in particular by belligerent parties. Chapter eight, Eliza Watt examines the impact of sustained drone surveillance on non-combatants in war zone and analyzes the legal constraints played by international humanitarian law and international human rights law on this practice. Chapter nine, Tara Davenport examines a really interesting uh, uh, issue. Uh, she identifies and analyzes the international legal rules that apply where parties to armed conflicts intercept and collect data stored on or passing through underwater sea cables. Moving to section three, uh, this part of the, the collection examines the obligation of militaries and humanitarian organizations when it comes to the protection of digital privacy rights. Chapter 10, Tim Cochrane explores the potential of individuals to obtain personal data from military agencies under the legal regimes of several states, namely Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, and draws out common themes, challenges, and problems. In chapter 11, Deborah Husson Kuriel, uh, who joins us today. Deb, chapter six by yourself. Hello, thank you for the chapter. In your chapter, you focus on data sharing within multilateral military operations, and in particular investigates whether and to what extent international law and national law protects the data privacy of members of their armed forces. In chapter seven, Azaf, uh, Azaf Lubin examines the obligations of international organizations to protect data in the context of their humanitarian actions and uses the ICRC as a case study. So this brings me to the final section, section four, which analyzes the protection of digital privacy rights in the use post bellum. This, this section begins with chapter 13 by Christina Helwig, and this examines the role of the right to privacy in the investigation and prosecution of international crimes, and focuses in particular on the rules and procedures of the International Criminal Court, but actually it also cuts across uh, the work of other international criminal tribunals. In chapter 14, Yael Ronen considers the right to be forgotten, that is the right of individuals to have digitalized personal information removed from the public sphere, and especially when it's linked to criminal activities. And finally, the final chapter, chapter 15, Amir Khane proposes a right not to be forgotten, which in order to protect digital identities, identities would place a moratorium on private tech companies preventing them from denying individuals caught up in humanitarian crises access to their online accounts. So that's the full uh, book. Um, and we're delighted, as, as I've said, um, that three distinguished commentators have agreed to lend their expertise and their, their time uh, to discuss the book. Um, and I'll just introduce them very briefly because, of course, uh, I'm sure they're all well known to you, but their biographies are available on the, the PSYCON website. Um, first up, 
Marco Milanovic, who is Professor of Public International Law at the University of Nottingham and co-general editor of the ongoing Italian Manual 3 project. Next, Yelena Page, who is a former senior legal advisor in the legal division of the International Committee of the Red Cross. And finally, Eduardo Usteran is a leading data protection expert and he is global co-head of the Hogan Lovell's Privacy and Cyber Security Practice. So thank you for joining us. I think we agreed 15 minutes um, per discussant. We'll start with Marco, then on to Elena, and then on to Eduardo. Um, and that should, if the mass is right, lead time for discussions and questions and answers at the end. Marco, sir, we'll start with you. Thank you so much, Russell. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, and, and thank you very much to, to you guys and to SciCon for inviting me to, to, to speak uh, on the panel. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and to speak about this really interesting, intriguing book. And it is that. I'm not just saying it because it's what's supposed to be said at book launches. It is a genuinely interesting novel book. Um, so as I've said, there was a gap in the literature. You know, nobody really explored this. And you sort of gave some reasons for why that's the case. To, to the reasons you gave, I would also add one. Until relatively recently, everybody would think you were crazy <laughs> if you were writing about the right to privacy and data protection in armed conflict. It's like science fiction, <laughs> right? How on earth are you supposed to talk about privacy in war? People are dying in war, right? When there's smell of death, sort of in the air, who cares about privacy? If the Ukrainian soldiers in the trenches, you know, do they have privacy, you know? So in, in, in some ways, it's a sort of bizarre topic. But actually, it works, and it is important. Cyber, in the cyber, strictly cyber context or not. And in fact, I think you really uh, you know, uncovered or, or, or started exploring a really important, really interesting set of issues. And even though there are more important things, more important considerations in war probably than privacy, that doesn't mean there is nil worth to privacy in war, or that we as human beings who uh, are endowed with human rights simply by virtue of being human, lose the right to private life simply because two states or a state and a non-state actor choose to engage in armed conflict. So it's a really important topic. Nobody has dealt with it before. Um, just to add sort of to the sense of importance of the topic, think about what's going on in Ukraine right now. So think about all the normal, regular people of Ukraine who are suffering some harm to their privacy interests as a result of Russian cyber attacks, which are probably not happening to the extent we most you know, anticipate, most of us anticipate, but are still happening. But think specifically about those people of Ukraine who have the misfortune of finding themselves under Russia's occupation. And think, if you live in Kherson right now, of the various measures of surveillance that Russia is imposing on you, okay? If you are a Ukrainian prisoner of war, and there are now thousands of Ukrainian prisoners of war in Russia's hands after Azovstal fell, again consider not just the basic humane treatment, dignity, obligations that the ICRC would always insist on, but think, for example, about how Russia is inevitably taking biometric data taking DNA samples, taking photographic uh, 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 material of all those individuals, think about their medical records. We can't just say, this stuff is trivial, this stuff is irrelevant, it is peripheral to the real you know, issues of fighting a war. So the key point that I will make here is the following. Human rights law cares about the interests of individuals as such, not about the rights of the state that may have been infringed. 
So when we discuss IHL and other rules of international law, in, for example, example, in the context of Ukraine, we would be focusing on the rights of Ukraine as a state. But human rights law is different and provides a very different perspective. It's about the rights of some poor guy you know, who is now in the hands of Russian soldiers or of the regular individual on the streets of Kherson who is now being surveilled wherever they go. It is the interest and the rights of that individual that human rights law uniquely as a part of international law really takes cognizance of and that we need to integrate in thinking about how human rights, uh, how uh, 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 fighting wars in the digital age should be uh, regulated. Okay, so that, that's sort of my pitch for their book in the sense that all, I think, war fighters and cyber operators who care about the respect of human dignity and individual rights, they need to think about privacy in particular and they need to buy their book, well, get it for free online, and read it to sort of start opening you know, their minds to issues they probably never thought of. And I think that's a really good thing. Now, the second point that I would make is that this is a really important case study, generally from the standpoint of conceptualizing the relationship between human rights and IHL. You know, the classical sort of lex specialis trope really breaks down here completely. Anne was, I think, overly generous in her assessment of how exactly many special rules of IHL they found that deal with privacy. There are really none. There are rules of IHL that could be stretched a bit so that they could fall within the scope of what we would regard as the human right to privacy. But when written, they were not conceptualized as such. When, for example, Article, thir Article 13, Paragraph 7 of GC3 prohibited the exposure of POWs to public curiosity, this wasn't written with the idea of protecting the individual privacy of the prisoners of war. So even though there is some overlap between these rules, it is impossible in this particular context to say IHL is special, it overrides human rights. There is simply no content to the IHL of privacy that could override human rights law. Just like, for example, IHL says nothing about the freedom of speech in occupied territory. The only thing we can do is interpret and apply human rights law in a feasible, realistic way, taking into account the extraordinary circumstances that are much farther from normalcy than that you would want them to be, so that they can have some kind of effective meaning in armed conflict. And this is what it's like with a lot of other human rights as well. Think, for example, the vast array of socioeconomic rights that again do not have any kind of clear equivalent in, in, in IHL. So let me now very briefly talk about the five most interesting challenges, I think, well, at least that I find interesting, um, from the uh, uh, right to privacy in armed conflict standpoint that are, you know, to, to a large extent dealt with in the book. The first is generally about gathering intelligence Specifically, when we gather, or when, when uh, militaries gather intelligence, not simply by hacking the uh, adversary state, getting their military plans or technologies or anything like that, but are actually employing technologies that target individuals. Either, you know, the specific person, or through bulk or mass collection of information. This is, as you know, a huge issue in peacetime as well. And there has been very recent guidance from human rights bodies on it. Some of it is discussed in the book. The most prominent, as you know, decision is the Big Brother Watch judgment of the, uh, of the European Court of uh, Human Rights. Now, the European Court has taken a relatively modest proceduralist approach in that decision, 
And you would imagine that the same approach to apply to armed conflict would be even more modest, even more cautious. But it means something. It means states that through their cyber operations, for example, affect the privacy of individuals in armed conflict, need to have some rules written down somewhere that govern this. That they need to have procedures that govern this. That they need to have oversight mechanisms that will check that the rules are complied with. That is a reasonable, modest demand that most states, at least, can comply with practically. So that's the first challenge. The second one is the issue of people in detention, whether POWs or civilians subject to internment and so on. Again, thank Ukraine. And there is an excellent chapter by Emily Crawford in the book that deals specifically with this issue. The third challenge is cyber operations that destroy private data or that otherwise manipulate or harm that data or that do something with it. For example, dump it online so people can see it. Now, as you all know, there is a huge debate in the confines of IHL whether data is an object for the purpose of targeting rules in IHL. And I don't want to get into that. I will only say this. Even if it's not an object, the human right to privacy applies. It will regulate what the state may or may not do, regardless of whether data is an object for the purpose of IHL. So even if you say data is not an object, it doesn't mean it's a free-for-all. Mm -hmm. That there's still a part of international law that can do something. Now, then there is the issue of intelligence sharing, that again, there's an excellent chapter uh, in the book about, uh, by Deborah. Um, we have seen this in, in, the, uh, uh, in the context of Ukraine, with all sorts of states sharing intelligence with Ukraine before and during the conflict, including for specific targeting purposes. Much of that type of intelligence sharing activity does not really involve information that is in any sense private. So if, for example, the United States tells Ukraine there's an attack coming on the military airport near Kyiv, or the Russian mobile headquarters in the Donetsk region are on such and such coordinates, this does not implicate the right to privacy. This is not private information. But if they send information about the identity of specific individuals, their facial recognition features, biometric profiles, whatever, this does implicate the right to privacy and uh, um, the rules of international human rights law and the rules of data protection at least need to be complied with to some extent. And the final challenge is the issue of extraterritoriality to what extent the human right to privacy applies to state action outside its borders. It's a long story, <laughs> but let's say the right answer is that it does. <laughs> <laughs> now, it applies on a very individual level outside armed conflict. It applies, to my mind, at a mass bulk collection level and in armed conflict. Think one example. Jeff Bezos, at the time, the richest man in the world, personally gets hacked by Mohammed bin Salman through a corrupted WhatsApp message. Okay? Saudi Arabia hacks one guy in America. It is, to my mind as a human rights lawyer, normatively completely incoherent to say that if Saudi Arabia spies on Saudis, that's a human rights issue. But if Saudi Arabia spies on an American guy in America, suddenly human rights law no longer applies. It makes no sense. Okay? In just the same way that if Saudi Arabia kills somebody in Saudi Arabia, that's a violation of the right to life. And if they kill Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul, that's also a violation of the right to life. So the right to privacy does apply extraterritorially whenever states do something that affects it. The issue is when exactly and how. Now, I will just end here with, by mentioning four really good 
chapters that I really think are specifically worth a read from a human rights standpoint. One is by Tal Mimran and Yuval Shani on integrating the human rights to privacy to weapons reviews, which is not something I think IHL experts would ever have thought of. A second, a really poignant chapter by Omar Shehabi is on what Israel has been doing in the occupied territories. Now, even if you take a pro-Israeli view of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, even if you do that, when you read the specifics uh, and the comprehensiveness of surveillance measures that pervade the everyday life of essentially every Palestinian, it should really make you think twice about what militaries can do and cannot do in an occupation context. And again, what Russia is now doing in Ukraine is very much along those lines. I already mentioned Emily's excellent piece on POWs. Leah West, who, who was already mentioned, had, did an excellent piece on, on facial recognition and on how facial recognition and biometrics should and should not be used in targeting processes. Now, that is not something that, I don't know, in the context of, of a mass conflict like Ukraine-Russia, you, you will have uh, done. But in the context of more novel, targeted terrorism type conflicts, where you know, a state is using a drone to kill somebody, that's very much on the agenda. And finally, there's a really interesting piece by Christina Helwig on the privacy implications of gathering evidence for international crimes. So think, for example, what the investigators are doing now in Ukraine, digging up mass graves, collecting information about POWs, interviewing POWs, collecting their statements. All of that information gathered by Ukrainian judges, prosecutors, by the ICC, needs to comply with international privacy safeguards. So I really enjoyed very much reading this book, and thank you so much for editing it and for inviting me to speak about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. That, uh, that's a lot of food for thought uh, uh, for us. Without further ado, I think I'll hand over to Yelena. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Marco said a lot of what I wanted to say um, at the very beginning. I would like to thank Asif and Russell for also inviting me here and for doing a stellar job on editing the book, but we mustn't forget on Vallataga. Did I get it right? Almost. You did, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, for, for me as well, it was a novel subject. I initially thought when I read the title, they're crazy. I mean, I had exactly the same reactions. Um, and then as I got into it, I realized, of course, that it is incredibly important and that these folks have actually done a first in terms of editing a book on this subject. And so I really perceive it as the start of a conversation um, that obviously will continue. I appreciated the fact that it is, it was, the, the chapters are well written, I thought, and, and that they are short. So <laughs> folks, I mean, that, that's really one thing I took away. Rather than this kind of endless blah, blah, repeating everything we already know before they got to the point, the chapters are between nine and 15 pages, 20 maybe some, but they're very much to the point. And so you have 17 chapters in a book of, 300 pages, and it was just a delight to, to have people speak to the point. Anyway, um, so I also, of course, agree with Marco that um, IHL doesn't say anything about privacy in armed conflict or data protection. In 1949, this was certainly not on the agenda, and we can't make believe it was otherwise. There are one or two norms that could be stretched, et cetera, et cetera. So I have nothing to add on that. Um, what I would like to do, however, is to, I intended to, very briefly mention the gist of three chapters, some of which Marco mentioned as well, and then to, to give a few general comments that may not necessarily relate to the book, but are more broader really on the issue of privacy, data protection, and, um, and armed conflict. So, so I also thought that Leah West's chapter was, was fascinating because she talks, she gives the facial recognition um, uh, ex case study to discuss the tension between the, con the um, operation and legal requirements to gather intelligence on the one hand, and then the rights of the civilian population um, to privacy in information operations. What I thought was interesting, 
And I actually chose these three chapters because each of them sort of either pose relevant questions that I thought or suggest way forwards, ways forward. <laughs> so what she said, Leah West, she, for example, asks that in future discussions, it should be determined under what circumstances FRT or similar technologies could be deployed, what data they will rely on to identify persons, um, what data will be collected, and how will um, consequences of improper use of FRTs be, be used, uh, be dealt with. And she also talks about a sliding scale, which again is a novel idea to say, if you may need to use FRT robustly at the beginning of a conflict, as time goes by, the need for these types of robust measures you know, will decrease. Um, Eliza Watt talked about drones and um, the effects of prolonged drone surveillance and the right to privacy. She also absolutely recognizes that IHL requires intelligence collection for commanders to be able to comply with the principles of distinction, um, proportionality, target verification. She then goes on to um, suggest the expansion of one of the rules to accommodate data privacy, data and privacy and data protection concerns, which is 50, Article 57 of AP1, which says that in the conduct of military operations, even though the chapter in AP1 is on attacks, but she says this should be seen as a standalone, in fact, rule, um, which says that constant care must be taken in the conduct of military operations to spare civilians, civilian populations, and civilian objects. And she said that that would be the hook to latch um, data protection and privacy obligations on commanders. Now, when she talks about the practical ways in which this could be done, she says that the data protection principles of lawfulness, transparency, and um, sorry, forgot one, and, and oops, yes, fairness should be um, kept in mind. Now, while lawfulness, personally, I understand, I mean, it's quite easy to say there is a lawful basis to do X, Y, and Z, and any state can provide such a basis. When it comes to transparency in drone operations, I'm thinking to myself, how do you do transparency as in, and it's specified that data subjects should be able to know that this data is being collected, you know, et cetera. And so that was, to me, a little bit unrealistic, and that's an understatement. Um, and then Emily Crawford's chapter is excellent in the sense that she simply shows, which I think we all know, that the tension is particularly strong with respect to detainees and POWs and civilian internees in international armed conflict in particular for two reasons. One is that, as we know, first of all, these are security threats per se. That's why POWs, that's why they're interned. And every manner of data is going to be collected on them from the moment they are registered onward, that their communications may be monitored, their letters may be censored, they may be under surveillance or will be in camps. And just as importantly, the detaining power has an obligation to collect data on such individuals to pass it on to the power of origin as soon as possible or to the ICRC through the central tracing agency in terms of who they are, you know, name, a whole range of personal facts, transfers, deaths, so as to be able to inform the power of origin that the person is in the detaining power's um, custody and so then either the ICRC or the power of origin will be able to um, inform the family. So um, it's not suggested that this is unlawful because it can't possibly be. I mean, there's a very good reason for this. But what is suggested is simply, among other things, and I'm not doing justice to any of these chapters, is simply that the whole issue of data protection and privacy would merit a sui generis, non-binding discussion process. I mean, a process that would end up with a sui generis non-binding document that would um, look into the issue of data protection and privacy in armed conflict. Okay. Um, so, as I said, all of these chapters 
and all of the others in the book. And one of the other things I really, really liked about the book is the scope of the chapters. So Deb's chapter dealt with these issues of data protection and privacy in the context of multinational military operations or intero intero interoperability. Then there's a chapter on cables, as was read. So it's really, really a, a palette of, of, of very interesting um, articles. One thing. So the, the general comments I would have, however, and I really do repeat this in all sincerity, this is not to do with the book, it's just more my general thinking as, as an IHL lawyer, is that the tension between, on the one hand, intelligence gathering and the obligation to do it, and on the other hand, data protection and privacy cannot be overstated, in, in my view. It just cannot. And while the book and the chapters often say Yes, yes, we need this. We, I mean, uh, intelligence has to be done so that there could be lawful targeting and the principles of IHL will be respected. It's not very often mentioned that actually intelligence gathering is also done for the purpose of the security of the, of one, of the party to the conflict of own forces, civilian components, military bases, what have you, both on own territory and when acting abroad. So that sort of security aspect to intelligence collection, regardless of whether you know, we're talking active combat, if you like, is something that I, I sort of found a little bit lacking. In this context, when we're talking conduct of hostilities, and we think of what one of the main legal bases, if you read the relevant documents, non-IHL documents, of course, is like, what is the most important thing? It is the consent of the data subject. Now, consent of the data subject in an in an IAC or <laughs> is going to be really difficult. And already humanitarian organizations such as the ICRC and others who did very thick handbooks on data protection by humanitarian organizations in their humanitarian activity have also had to come to the conclusion that obtaining consent, you know, when you're dealing with an emergency situation, you have it can be man-made, it can be a natural disaster, you have earthquakes, what have you, you're coming in, you're talking to people, you're trying to figure out what's going on, how to produce, um, rather deliver food, etc. You don't have time to say, sir, I'm going to take down your data, or madam, and then this is what I'm going to do with it, and do you agree, and then there will be erasure of the information, and all the other data protection um, steps or principles that data protection human rights law and certainly the European GDRP, the General Data Protection Regulation, would require. So, you know, the first, if I can put it that way, pillar is out. <laughs> I mean, it, in most situations, in a lot of situations, it will be a given. And I think that, generally speaking, going forward in discussing this issue, um, that a distinction should be made between, on the one hand, data protection and conduct of hostilities, where you will have massive collection of data, and where the technology will be used in quite differently, of course, and I think the principles will be much harder to apply, and then data protection and privacy in situations of detention, for the reasons that were mentioned. You have the person in custody, and so the question can be, what level and what scope of personal information may you need in order to satisfy your, your security um, considerations. Just to park one issue is that IAC and NIAC and data protection in international and non-international armed conflict, <laughs> question mark, what do we do with non-state armed groups, principle of belligerent equality, blah, blah, blah. I personally don't believe, contrary to many on the panel, I think that human rights, that human rights binds NSA non-state armed groups de jure. I don't believe so. And so that's a whole different can, can of worms that would have to be opened. And then we come to the crux of the matter, I think, <laughs> which is the relationship between IHL and human rights and how the book's contributors, and I'm sure the human rights community, are going to deal more generally with, yes, more generally with the relationship by basically saying, which is what the book says, this is an old discussion. We are just going to assume that human rights and IHL apply concurrently or in a complementary fashion. I don't disagree with that, but I would make three points, which always come up and drive me personally completely mad. I mean, because there's never an answer. 
when somebody says human rights law applies concurrently, that doesn't mean anything to me. I mean, what exactly are you referring to? What scope? You know, where is the binding law? You know, what exactly are we talking about? And that discussion in the domain of data protection and privacy in armed conflict certainly, I mean, definitely remains, you know, remains on the table. So what data protection and privacy in human rights law, oops, I'm being too loud, <laughs> will mean in any um, given case is not clear. And certainly um, states will have different interpretations based in addition on whether they accept extraterritorial application. I may agree or disagree with this, but the fact is that a lot, of, let me put it this way, several significant states that do wage wars all the time, or quite frequently, reject the, the extraterritorial application of human rights law. So, we, I mean, that conundrum cannot simply be, simply be wished away. In this respect, Having worked at the ICRC, I'm no longer with the ICRC, I'm speaking in my personal capacity. One of the things as a practitioner that I always came up against was when we would, I would sit across militaries and they would go, okay, so what's the source of this obligation? This was my constant problem, and there's a problem. This was a valid legal question. So we didn't, I didn't have the luxury to say, I'm gonna throw the kitchen sink at you and the special rapporteur's reports, and this, and that, and the other, that everyone thinks of as human rights law. So if there's going to be a constructive discussion on privacy and data protection in armed conflict, what is the binding law is going to be unbelievably important. And as a policy matter, one has to decide, I think, going forward, if there is going to be a forward is, as I said, do you throw the kitchen sink and just conduct an academic discussion and say human rights applies with not much precision, or do you try and unpack, you know, slowly but surely, one by one, what is more realistic to begin with, you know, as a matter of privacy and data protection and armed conflict, and then work upwards or downwards, whichever way you like, but the most important thing is with military practitioners, people who are going to tell you or us, you're crazy. <laughs> I mean, I, I pretty much have no, no doubt about that. Another issue with, with human rights law, and this also has driven me pretty bananas in the past, is that human rights lawyers, they always tend to talk about human rights as being European law, and particularly the European Court of Human Rights and what the EU does. And in this particular domain, it's really the bulk of the, the law. And so to say that other countries are going to be jumping up and down with joy to <laughs> adopt the GDPR, and et cetera. You know, again, there needs to be more rigor in determining, you know, not only what is the binding law, but what region of the world, in fact, does it, does it emanate from? And this is really a region in which, I mean, a situation in which European law um, has been predominant. I'm, I'm actually finishing, believe it or not. So my sense would be, is, and if I were um, kind of called to think about this further, if you look at the data protection um, principles on, under the GDPR, because this is the document of reference, as I mentioned, it's European, then my concern um, would be, for example, to, to look immediately and most um, in great detail about two issues. One is the issue of data security by parties to an armed conflict. You know, how do they, when they collect it, whether it's in conduct of hostilities or in detention, what do you, first of all, to the extent possible, what is the purpose limitation, if any? But secondly, what is the storage? Meaning physical storage of the data, and then secondly, what organizational and technical measures are taken to preserve the data so it doesn't fall into either unauthorized hands within your own people or cannot be hacked you know, by third parties for nefarious purposes. So data security is incredibly important. I was also thinking to myself, maybe this is a provocative question, which is the issue of time limitation. If armed conflict ends, as we know, at the end of active hostilities, IAC as well as NIAC, obviously, when there is no more fighting, not to go into the legal niceties of what that is, 
then why would states keep data, particularly in an IAC, of millions of enemy citizens, whether they be POWs or civilians, whom they had collected data on? So in the book, one of the articles says that the US has collected you know, two million um, files on two million persons' biometric data in Iraq. So look, I understand the emotional resonance I truly do of Ukraine, but this is by no means what the Russians are doing, or is by no means, um, how do you say, uh, exceptional. Mm -hmm. Biometrics have been around for a long time, and maybe one of the first things that needs to be discussed is biometrics in armed conflict. What is the purpose of them? And then, I mean, that, that's a discrete, that's a sort of discrete issue. Um, and then, as I said, con lawfulness, consent is going to be a problem, purpose limitation, it's probably possible in detention, probably less likely in the conduct of hostilities, storage limitation, data security, and then accountability. Once again, accountability, uh, yes, you can have oversight mechanisms, I'm sure, to look at whether data protection and privacy have been respected in armed conflict. But the point is, as a matter of human rights law, it's really the individual who should be able to go to an authority and say, I want to know what you have on me. And I thought Tim Cochrane's um, chapter was kind of touching in that respect because he basically says that an Afghan civilian, who, by the way, in like 90%, or I'm exaggerating, 75% of cases will be illiterate. The idea that he or she are going to go to the US or any other military and say, I'd like to know what you have on me, and then I'd like it to be erased, and then I'd like it to be accurate if you're going to hang on to it. You know, we, we've got to get real. It's not for a minute really denying the importance of the issue, which I think is open and, and will continue. And my last two points, really quickly. I was, and maybe this is a pie in the sky for my part, but I was struck by the fact that, and maybe this is because not military practitioners were not involved, necessarily in the book, is why the notion of feasibility and military necessity were not introduced at, in some shape or form in, in the discussion, you know? Because feasibility is, is, a, it is a term that, that can, you know, serve useful purposes and yet enable, you know, the keeping of flexibility um, in armed conflict. And then for military necessity, I could see it more you know, already, for example, in POW situations, POWs are obliged to give a very limited amount of information to their captors. I know Mike is going to react, and that's, that's very fine. But, and I can answer that, I think. <laughs> but the, the, the issue is, if a POW is not obliged to give to the captor anything more than name, last name, regimental number, rank, etc., then why would any other information be available to the captor? I mean, it's, it's just a question. And then my final point is that um, one thing that going forward also needs to be discussed is that, again, talking from practice, um, militaries, or the ones I've been in touch with, very rarely do something out of pure altruism, <laughs> which I think everyone around this room knows. So there, there's got to be something that either they understand will benefit them in the immediate or the longer term. So there's also needs to be thinking because the application of these issues or these rules in our conflict, what does it mean? It means resources, it means people, it means training, it means doctrinal adaptations, it will mean a whole range of things if it ever were to come really into you know, military thinking mainstream. And so the question is really, what are the incentives? Is it just reciprocity? I mean, de facto reciprocity, of course. Or um, would it be something else? And the reason I say this is because in issues that are much more, uh, have much more immediate consequences, and the, where the militaries understand um, the consequences of not doing, getting it right, such as investigations in armed conflict, which is an issue I have dealt with before, it's very hard to get them to do resources, funding, and all of this. And they keep saying, oh, this is too time consuming, this is too funding consuming, et cetera, et cetera. And so there needs to be you know, a broader sort of mix of, of 
thinking on an issue that's been well identified, definitely, and so kudos for that. I say that sincerely to the both of you. Um, but maybe a, a more narrow focus and with perhaps uh, the audience, you know, that wages wars, which is members of the armed forces. So I'll, thank you. Sorry to have been so long. That, that was great. Thank you for the, your very careful reading and review of the book. You contextualized the discussions, but also brought new life um, to them. Uh, without further ado, we'll pass to uh, Eduardo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let, let me start with a, with a confession, or at least an, an acknowledgement, which is I'm new to this world, to this, not, not, not like the conference stages or, or cybersecurity the armed conflict world. I'm a lawyer, I'm based in London, I work in a law firm, I've spent my entire professional career working in a, in a non-conflict related environment. My, my only involvement in this world was uh, many, many years ago serving in, doing my military service more than three decades ago in the Spanish army. And then after that, I entered the sort of what to me has been the normal world. And of course, data protection, which is what I practice, has always been outside the military context, the armed conflict. And a bit like what you were saying, a book about data protection in the context of armed conflict, what does that have to do with it? And what I deal with on a daily basis, which is you refer to the GDPR, the GDPR is is my Bible in, in a way, in the sense that's, that's where, uh, what, I, what I have to, to advise on, what I work on all the hours of the day. And the, the GDPR, the, G, the European Union data Protect, General Data Protection Regulation, specifically excludes certain aspects from the uh, scope, from the, the scope of, of what the law is about. And, it doesn't say, oh, it doesn't apply in a military context. It doesn't say that at all. But it does refer to the fact that European Union law does not apply to certain elements, like, for example, national security, which, as the word suggests, is, is for the nations, for the countries. So basically, this is all to say that until now, I thought, well, data protection, the, mili the military is not something that I see being related to. This book, this changes all that. This, it really, if, if there is one thing that uh, I've realized is that, of course, privacy and data protection are very, very relevant to this world of conflict. And the one thing also that I think, if there is one thing you learn from, from the book, and I, and I do encourage everybody to, to read, there are loads of things that we, we will learn. But if there is one key message that I got out of it, is that international human rights law is very, very relevant to armed conflict. And of course, again, in, in, in the world of, of conflict, we're used to, or at least uh, you are used to, in international humanitarian law, dealing with, with that element of that. Well, I think your, your bit of human rights is very, very, very relevant. And I think that comes across very strongly across, across the, the, the chapters and across everything that um, is, is, is the, the, the mosaic, in a way, that this, this book is. So what I also uh, learned from, from the book is that there are things that I deal with on a daily basis that I can see how relevant they are to armed conflict. For example, we, I work with some of the leading technology companies in the world. Those, those are my clients, and I, and, and I have to be a, at the forefront of, of what technology is and how it develops. Well, it is very obvious, reading the chapters of this book, that, and I guess you don't even need to read the book to realize that, 
that technological development is also at the forefront of armed conflict. In fact, it's, it's the perfect test bed to, to, to develop and to put into practice some of the technologies that are really defining human evolution right now. And the kind of things I deal with, biometrics, facial recognition, artificial intelligence, communications, all of these different things are obviously very, very relevant. Facial recognition, um, it, it's interesting you said, well, is that even relevant, for example, to, to the war in Ukraine? Well, if you, if you have a drone that is targeting a particular, let's say, general, and try to recognize a face from many miles up in the air, Facial recognition is indeed very relevant, and it may have actually proved crucial in, in the conflict that we're seeing now. All types of technologies that, again, we are testing from a privacy, from a data protection perspective, some of the points you were making about um, how the law, outside conflict, the law and the GDPR has been written in a way that is designed to test technologies up front. So there is a whole mechanism, legal mechanism, to ensure that from the, at the outset, from the point of view of, from the point of, of development, privacy and data protections are very much taken into account. And this, I think, is, is relevant in this context. Cybersecurity, I mean, this, this event is about cyber conflict. Cyber, cyber attacks, I think, are probably a, one of the most powerful weapons from the point of view of the wider effect that they may have. And I have seen clients, um, which are not in the, in the military world, being attacked by state agents and crippling their organizations worldwide. Well, again, this is something that, from the point of view of cyber defense, <coughs> is, is pretty obvious. But it also, it's also highlights for me how uh, much overlap there is between the sort of what I would call the, the state side of things, the, the public sector side of things, and the private sector, and the one that I'm closer to. And how important it is for the private sector to be aware of the cyber threats that have a military origin, if you want, or a military um, aim, and how affected everyone is, whether you're shopping at Amazon or using your credit card or, or whatever you're, we are doing, how affected we are by Again, military-related cyber attacks. And then there is another aspect of uh, you, the law I deal with, which I, again comes across very, very clearly here, which is um, international data transfers. Again, in the world in which, or the professional world which I inhabit, International data transfers are probably the number one concern because data protection laws around the world govern how data, personal data can flow, and they place limitations. And a lot of the limitations have to do with ensuring that the data is protected in accordance with the European standards, if you're in Euro, the, the, the standards of, of the country of origin. Again, reading, in fact, uh, chapters about the importance of recognizing the international element of conflict, it is pretty obvious to me that recognizing the importance of addressing not just international data flows, but international data protection in a way that is consistent with the global nature of data is really, really important. 
And the final point that I would make in terms of the overall message that I, I, I took away is that, interestingly, again, in, in the data protection world in which I normally operate, and the GDPR, again, is at the, at the essence of that, we always talk about the risk-based approach, how the law needs to be interpreted in a way that is not an absolute way. It's, it changes, or the, the degree of the sort of the degree by which obligations under the law apply will be slightly different depending on the risk. Again, the risk and the and the importance and the context. You know, going back to the to your point, the context of conflict and the importance of, you know, I guess some. Um, some people defending their, their own country, for example, and how you apply data protection law on privacy law in that much wider context is very much related to that risk-based approach, which in fact is <coughs> at the essence of what data protection or modern data protection is about. So I've learned a lot, um, and I think it is really, really um, refreshing in a way to, to know that data protection, privacy as, as a discipline is also very, very, very relevant in the context of armed um, conflict. So um, I thought I, I just took a ton of amounts of notes as, as everyone was taking. I thought I, I want to just react to a few things that were mentioned across the panel that I do think would be interesting to the broader audience watching this. Um, and, and might further shed light about the importance of the project in a broader sense. What we're talking about in this book already shapes the way militaries are currently behaving right now. And in that regard, what we're discussing throughout the book isn't only about the kind of future-looking, the desired approaches of some human rightsy folks who want to change the world and will never get to do it. I just want to highlight to you a few ways by which militaries have to deal with the issues that the book discusses already today. And the first is market pressures. So right now, militaries are contracting with private companies to develop the very technologies at the heart of the discussions that we've been having. And it is the companies that Eduardo advises who are providing the technologies back to those militaries. And those companies, unlike the militaries who might be immune to certain data protection regimes, it is those companies who are not. And it is in that sense, when they engage with data sets, they are applying data protection rules and by default making the militaries comply with certain data protection standards. Or the contract might try to immune, immunize or exclude the application of data protection in the context of these um, contracting around the development of new technologies. And I think that that generates new complex contract law questions around the reliance on outsourcing to private companies in the development of, say, military AI ap applications or military biometric analysis solutions and so on and so forth. A second problem is constitutional constraints. And here, Tim's chapter in the book, I think, is really revealing. When the military collects data about the military, about its own forces, say the health information of your own uh, soldiers, and say shares that data then with um, um, other militaries through a data sharing arrangement, well, now you have a lot of really complex question around the constitutional limitations around the collection data on your own citizens, and then that sharing of that data with third parties. Um, and that's questions the militaries have to deal with because every time they engage in uh, joint operations or, or joint exercises and need to share certain information about the people participating, that's personally identifiable information. And someone needs to decide which law applies in the regulation of those uh, activities. And that ties to various other types of peer constraints. And I think Deb's chapter really demonstrates peer constraints in this regard. And I think that across, going back even outside of the data protection context to intelligence sharing, 
the way other intelligence agencies would work with you or refuse to work with you unless you comply with certain standards sets restrictions and obligations. And so in that regard, if a German intelligence agency has to comply with the GDPR because the Germans have determined that the GDPR or certain data protection standards apply to German operations, it will then compel the, the US say, if you want to share data with me, if you want me to share data with you, to comply with those standards, creating uh, echoing effects across their data flows and data transfers. Um, and the last one, I think, to demonstrate why it's not all about pure altruism, has to do with interoperability and confidentiality. At the end of the day, the militaries, while engaging in these activities, have built-in desires to ensure that the data they're collecting is secure, and that um, as they're collecting data across all their databases, there's various interoperability challenges that would mean that if a leak here happens, it could flow to leaks elsewhere across my systems, thereby generating the desire to create good practices of data protection and cybersecurity across the entirety of your network, uh, and not setting different standards in different contexts. And I think that all, all throughout these areas, that generates um, a, a need for these militaries to just speak up and so I completely take the point, and it is a true point, that the majority of this book is the writings of academics. Um, while some of us have worked within militaries and certainly have exper shared experiences around military work, the book is not written with a military uh, professional practice um, experience in mind. Um, but at the same time, it's those militaries who are engaging in these practices and are failing to articulate publicly what they're doing covertly. And so what the book is doing is just inviting a, demonstrating, a demonstration across an array of areas where the militaries are currently engaging with decisions around data protection, uh, data collection, data processing, and all of that, and then inviting them, well, instead of us academics coming here and telling you what to do or telling you what you should do, um, maybe you can come in and tell us what you're actually doing, and we can start developing at the minimum best practices, at the maximum customary norms or interpretations of existing treaty obligations. Just two more points for me, and then I, I, I'll, leave, I'll move to Russell. I don't want to hog uh, the time. Just two more thoughts. One is, on June 15, the American Society of International Law International Law and Technology Interest Group is holding a virtual event on the data protection obligations of international courts and international organizations. And we're bringing in uh, representatives from the IC, uh, ICC, um, which is an interesting body who's been engaging in, as, as, as um, um, Christina Helwig's chapter demonstrate, has been engaging in vast data collection for its internal investigations, and yet has no policy on privacy, no public-facing data protection standards. Um, and so, these are some of the bodies, ICRC is another one, and I obviously write a controversial chapter in this book about the ICRC that I'll admit is controversial. But th these are bodies that we look up to and expect to adopt the highest possible standard. And yet, there's a whole spectrum of action across these international courts, international organizations. I'll just na name one case, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon El, El Ayash decision in which the court literally says, we're a chapter seven court, so we're above any human rights norms. And therefore, when we engage in mass data collection over 10 years of geolocation data from the phones of everyone in Lebanon, we're somehow not going to apply any privacy standards at the request of the defense, because we're above that. I think that there's really controversial and problematic areas, and that's before we started talking about militaries and states. These are the entities that we'd expect at a minimum, to apply these rules as a matter of international law binding on them, not just as a matter of a general best practice, voluntary application of these rules. The last thing I, I want to mention, and I'll stop there, is that it is absolutely true that when we talk about some of these data protection standards, they will have to be reassessed and reevaluated and morphed to accommodate the unique specialized elements of war and the military necessity needs humanitarian requirements and so on. And so when we talk about things I think um, uh, uh, Yelena correctly identified, like transparency or consent of the data subjects, how, how that manifests in an armed conflict situation will need to be different. And that is that relationship, that amorphous and who knows how it applies, like specialist, like generalist relationship that we talk about in other contexts of application of human rights law in IHL. And yet, 
it is not to say that these rights should be completely be taken out the table. So in the transparency context, the European Court of Human Rights in Big Brother Watch for UK didn't remove the right of an individual to seek an ability to go to courts in a foreign country and ask that country, can you tell me what data you've collected about me? The European Court sets a lot of limitations on how you do that, including that where it th threatens the efficacy of the, of the intelligence operation, you don't have an obligation to disclose, um, and certain other limitations around um, standing and access rights. But it doesn't negate the possibility of this happening even in the most confusing intelligence context which is to say that at the baseline, what the book is telling you is that we should avoid national security exceptionalism and mission creep to a point where none of this should ever be discussed the second we started talking military or war mm -hmm. or armed conflict. Rather, that we need to find out how we, in a complex, nuanced manner, apply these standards in this unique way. And I'll just demonstrate to you that this is happening, whether we want it or not, in Schrems 1, Schrems 2. In Schrems II, the Court of Justice of the European Union has essentially compelled the US, a country that has defended the idea that human rights do not apply extraterritorially, especially in the surveillance context, has now compelled it in the new Biden administration's framework agreement with the Europeans to allow Europeans, for the first time ever, to be able to go to courts in the US and ask to know what data about them has been collected. Who would have thought that kind of thing, um, if, if applied, and we're still waiting on the framework agreement to manifest an actual law, but if applied, it will be the biggest intelligence overhaul since Watergate. It will certainly be the first one to be compelled externally by a European court, no less. Super. Thank you for, thank you for the comments by the discussants, uh, Azaf. Let's open the floor to questions, to comments. I can see that we have uh, a hand uh, here um, at the back. Um, thank you so much. My name is Aydar. I'm from Kazakhstan. Basically, I want to ask a specific case in terms of, in the context of Ukraine and Russia. So uh, on March 2nd, uh, some hackers attacked a Russian company called Yandex, specifically the service Yandex Food, who, which is a widely spread all across the region, so across the Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan, as far as I remember. So what happened there was a data leak of two million users, their uh, names, home addresses, and, uh, well, basically delivery addresses, uh, personal emails, and probably to some extent their banking information, was leaked uh, to the general public uh, in a huge SQL database. So, uh, but the perpetrators were not identified, uh, obviously. So the question basically is, what if this hack happened from, uh, originated from uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian's army cyber division, for instance, right? Uh, would that hack fall into, uh, under, the, the, under the IHL? Because uh, both in Jus and Bello principle and in IHL, there is a, a principle of discrimination, uh, which basically says that you can attack only the targets of military necessity or the military targets specifically, and you should leave out the civilians uh, out of the conflict. In this case, I'm, what I'm asking is, uh, it is clear w uh, with the situation with personal data of Russian citizens, but what if, or what about the personal uh, situation with the personal data of Kazakhstani citizens? Uh, would, can we, for instance, uh, ask from the, uh, see, consider this as a, con a violation of IHL? Or how would IHL deal with this situation? Thank you. I know that there's a chapter on this, on, about the third uh, states and neut uh, neutral states, but still, I, yeah, thank you. Just would take the final questions. Thank you. Uh, I think there's a phenomenal effort. So congratulations to both of you for coordinating this and to the chapter contributors as well. Um, how would you respond to claims by states uh, who say that you are now trying to bring privacy in through the back door by the universalization of certain rights um, uh, in the IHL regime? Given that in the book borrows on conceptual linkages between both, so you can't now say that there is this clear separation. Once it goes into the IHL regime, it won't come back. And related to that, um, 
as you would know, many civil society movements across the world in different countries are fighting for greater privacy protections. If you are relying on state practice and opinion jurists to sort of come through to this in IHL, reasonable to expect that you will get a set of minimum standards in the beginning. Wouldn't that have a reverse effect of undermining privacy movements across, the world, uh, across uh, different parts of the world where states will say, look, this is the IHL protections that we agreed to after much negotiations. You, this is what you will get in national law as well. So I don't want to hog the responses to either of those questions. I, I will say a couple of things um, uh, in response to both of, of the questions that were asked. First, um, um, Alitza Watts' chapter was already mentioned, and she does talk about um, the obligations to spare the civilians um, and civilian um, uh, um, um, uh, to spare the civilians from um, harms in military operations. By the way, that originally, um, would you just acknowledge, in 2013, um, um, another contributing author um, wrote a, a, an article in the International Law Study, Legal Studies Journal that had made the first argument around this. But um, um, the point I'm trying to convey here is that there are certain linchpins within the existing um, Geneva Conventions on which you can start to build theories, and there will be theories, there will be arguments, they're not, I can't give you Lex Lata to answer your question, but theories on why it could be said that militaries have certain obligations, as we talk military operations broader than just military attacks, as was mentioned, to spare civilian life, spare from what, from harms that are broader than just death and carnage, um, to start justifying certain due diligence obligations, certain standards of protection, cybersecurity, uh, when you're engaging in particular kinds of military operations. By the way, in peacetime as in wartime, and some of the chapters talk about that distinction, but the reality is that a lot of what we're talking about will need to start in a peacetime stage at, as to have effects for wartime purposes, which is another hard one because we're applying it, IHL rules outside of an armed conflict context immediately. Um, but the point is that one can try and stretch rules within the conventions to cover these issues, or one could try and build on human rights law standing alone and existing alongside or in parallel or interpreting the rules to take into account those human rights frameworks. And so I think that, the, that that goes also to the response to the second question, which I think is valid, um, and we've seen. The second we militarize a conversation, there might be opportunities for abuse and misuse of, of, of that language. And we're not here with this book to offer a definitive answer to any of the debates that we're <laughs> highlighting. It's the opposite. If anything, we're trying to highlight the debates because as you saw across this panel, it's debates that are not being had anywhere publicly. I do think, and that's what I'm trying to suggest to you, they are being had internally within certain militaries. And what we're hoping to do is just to flash the discussions out and then invite militaries to step in and say, where, what are the spectrum of opinions? And I should say, this is not new. So data protection has been responsive. The data protection law has been responsive. First, companies started to collect data, and then government's responses to overuses, mis, um, 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 uh, abuses of data collection, data processing, with certain data protection standards. In the same way, this is, can be a responsive action to what military's data invasive practices are demonstrating in real time. And same goes also to the entire Talon Manual response. At the end of the day, Talon Manual was one of the first massive articulations of the law here, which led to governments then reacting, challenging some of the arguments, adopting others in a set of statements. This kind of responsive and iterative process, which led to Talon Manual 2.0, now Talon Manual 3.0, is the way you gener generate a conversation. I think the same needs to happen in the space of some of the discussions that we have. I, I, I'm stop talking. I, I won't talk at all. <laughs> Elena, I saw you. Did you raise your yeah, hand? I, yes, I wanted to say two things as well. In, in response to your question in particular, I mean, what I did try to say is that IHL does not provide the answer to your question. I mean, that's the bottom line. That's what you know we've been trying to say. So, I, I, I think there are two different issues. One is the issue of whether data represents you know an object that is protected or not under the conduct of hostilities, and the jury is out on that. Mike Schmidt is the person to ask. Uh, 
Um, my understanding is that the jury is still out and there are different views. It's an unresolved question. But the question you really ask, I think, is a question of data security, you know, cyber security, excuse me, the hack that you mentioned, two million people, et cetera. IHL honestly does not deal <laughs> with that at all, so we have to look to other bodies of law. But as I have the floor, I'm gonna hog it too. <laughs> Just to respond to uh, um, Asaf, if I may, um, because he touched a nerve, which is my former ICRC identity, to say that I don't think that the chapter on the international organizations was quite fair mm -hmm. for the following reasons. Um, well, one, because speaking, first of all, the issue of whether, again, Marco will be probably a better place than I to speak about this, but the issue of does human rights law directly bind an international organization is really unres thank you Marco is really unresolved and you Asaf took it as a given and it's not so um, if you ask the United Nations are you bound by IHL I mean I know this from an IHL point of view their answer is no <laughs> I mean it will dip they are bound by the Secretary General's bulletin on IHL from I can't remember the date now when the UN is in command and control of, for example, peacekeeping missions with a robust mandate. But that almost never happens. So, I mean, look at the situation in Haiti and the, what was it, the cholera, if I'm not mistaken, outbreak, et cetera. I mean, there's no, you, you, it, it can't be taken as a given that they are bound by as a matter of law. And most recently, I read a very, I thought, inter very interesting article by Noel Kenive. Yeah. who actually just recently, maybe 10 days ago, outlined all the theories on the basis of which people have said that uh, international organizations may or may not be bound. But none, to my mind, really reflects the practice of these organizations. And the second thing I would say in relation to that is um, international organizations, uh, Yes, including the ICRC, way preceded any militaries <laughs> by coming out with their data protection handbooks vis-a-vis -vis their beneficiaries. So the handbook on humanitarian data protection and humanitarian action is like 400 pages, and then, which is a collective effort between the ICRC and a Belgian um, university think tank, but encompassed a range of actors in its creation. And then the ICRC has a range of its own internal documents. So to suggest that the organizations have been silent, UNHCR has one, et cetera, is not quite you know, a fair critique. Um, sorry, and the last thing I wanted, I guess, and the last thing I wanted to say is, with respect to the ICRC, of course, to expect the ICRC to be in the forefront of something that is not IHL, <laughs> but is a pure human rights concern in which there is so much uncertainty is also a bit of a, a, a tall order. You know, so I personally was quite pleasantly surprised that, I mean, I know this, of course, since, for, since 2015, the book and the data protection um, regulations have been out. So you kind of painted two, yeah, yeah, too black a picture, <laughs> I think. <laughs> And it's, it's not really quite that bad. Thank you, Elena. Are we running out of time? Um, Mike wanted to ask a question, I think, or somebody else did. Yeah, mm -hmm. we indeed are running out of time, especially the ones who plan on taking to walking tour. So, OK, uh, so we're, it was a nice afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In which I case, we'll, uh, we'll bring the it's discussion to an end. Just it's let me again thank walk. our discussants for uh, engaging so thoughtfully <laughs> with the book. And uh, thank you all for attending. Okay. I've been to, I've been to thank you.